This is Siobhan Chan Blackwell uh, from the National Library of Medicine Disaster Information Management Research Center. I want to welcome you to today's webinar um, where we're lucky to have staff from the National Center for Disaster Medicine and Public Health discuss their training, uh, disaster uh, health training tools that they have developed recently. But before we turn the um, webinar over to them, I want to um, share with you our um, most exciting news that we have launched a new design on our website. And so hopefully you can see that right now uh, on your screens. We're very happy to have this new resource, and I'm just going to take a few minutes uh, to go over it. Um, I do want to let you know that if you have any questions um, at any time during the webinar, there's a chat box at the top of the page that you can click on. You can send a message to all participants, and um, uh, Stacy Arneson, our branch chief, is monitoring questions, and she will make sure to um, let us know, let me know if there's any questions, or let our um, our next presenters know if there's any questions. Okay, so uh, Stacy put the the link to our website into the chat box. It's the same URL that we've always had, just a new look on that URL. So. Um, there's a few ways to navigate the page. If you take a look at the top, we have uh, links that, uh, when you hover over them, have some items that drop down. And a lot of these you will see as we scroll down the page. These are kind of the top resources that people come to our home page to find. But it's not, this doesn't have everything on it, but it has kind of the top features. So. Um, and we also have here this drop down to search, to do a site search. But if I scroll down the page, then you can see um, a lot of the things that get duplicated. Like here's the Severny hazmat tools. A lot of that drop down menu is here. But as I said, we don't have everything. So for example, um, a lot of the things on this third layer are not going to show up in that drop-down menu. And then at the very bottom, we have um, the information about us, the archives to all of our pages, things like that. And we have links to our, our Twitter feed, um, our RSS feed, and ways to subscribe to our listserv and um, resources that, that push out information to you about updates to our website. So I'm going to just do a quick demo on um, a couple of what you will, a couple of things that you'll see when you come to the website that are redesigned. We've tried to update and make a few things clearer and cleaner. So, for example, here we do have a rotating um, carousel that uh, we focus on some things that maybe we've updated wiser or. There's wildfires going on right now, so here's a great page to go and take a look at. I'm going to take a look at hurricanes. Hurricane season started June 1st. So here is our health information guide for um, hurricanes. And what we've, what we've done, this, this um, is the format that we've used in um, our, all of our information guides, is we continue to start with this overview of where are resources from some of the primary agencies that deal with hurricanes and, and the health information around them. And then we have uh, broken up into these sections that do pre-formulated searches in Disaster Lit, the gray literature database, and PubMed. So what you'll see are the two newest resources, in this case, on hurricanes in gray literature, and the two newest resources that will show up in PubMed, the, um, the, the literature, the published literature. So if I click on the More button in the bottom right-hand corner, that will take me to that resource, and will and you can see here, this is the search that was done to find information on hurricanes in Disaster Lit. So um, here is that pre-formulated search done for us. 
Uh, one of the things that you'll notice in the left-hand side is that we now have ways to search in the um, in the in the filters. So if I wanted to search for um, the administration for children and families, I could actually just type in ACF. Oops. And that will pull up the administration for children and families because we have those initials in um, the name of the source. So we're pretty excited about that. We have a few things to tweak on um, that, for example, if I type in the CDC, um, I will get six items from the CDC, but if I scroll down, we actually have several different departments from the CDC, and so I will miss those because we have to go in. This is, you know, we're learning things, and, and we have to add CDC into the abbreviations here. Um, for, for example, the Office of Public Health and Preparedness. So we're working on some of these things, and we're going to ask you to let us know if you see anything like that as you're exploring the website. Let us know, and um, we're happy to get your feedback and um, make the changes that we need to make to make all of this work. So you can still limit by, um, by type, by year. So I've selected 2018 as my limit, and now I can see on hurricanes what's the latest things that have come out this year on hurricanes. And I can change my page number, print and download, etc. So uh, we're very excited about these changes to disaster lit. If I go back to the home page, um, I actually can search disaster lit or PubMed right here from the home page, so I could could put in uh, hurricanes. Um, it's not going to get me the exact search that I just saw because I didn't add in Katrina and Sandy, so I might miss things that I got in the um, when I was on the hurricanes page. So that's the beauty of doing the search using our pre-formulated searches because we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out um, what are the best ways to do a search? So let me go back to the home page. Everything, everything lives on the home page. That's the, that's the beauty now of, of all of this is all you need to know is that one URL and you can get to all of this information. Um, we have, as always, our social media. Um, down here at the very bottom, you can see that you can still get to our promotional materials, or you can look at the About Us, and you can find our promotional materials, which we're happy to have you print out and share wherever you, wherever you go. Um, our Disaster Apps and Digital Go Bag page has always been um, a page that people love and go to all the time, which is why it's highlighted on our home page. And we have a promotional flyer for that if you um, want to share it. And then um, I want to show uh, on our disaster information specialist, you're on the webinar. So here's the link to the, to the webinars. And in a week, hopefully, um, this webinar, which right now is here in the upcoming webinars, will be moved down to the 2018 archived webinars, where you where the description will still be there and where you can always find the recordings and the presentation slides from um, all of our past webinars. Also part of the specialization is the training and education. And I wanted to show you this page um, because we have our disaster information specialization, which you can take the courses um, that are linked here and earn a specialization from the Medical Library Association. We list all of the courses that we have created. And then we have a list of um, curriculum and training from other organizations, including this one from the National Center for Disaster Medicine um, and Public Health. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen because I think that that is a great segue into um, turning the session over to them.
All right. Thank you so much, Siobhan. This is Condra Strauss-Riggs. I'm the Education Director here at the National Center for Disaster Medicine and Public Health. Um, and I'm uh, going to start, and then uh, Victoria Klimczak, our project coordinator here, will take over for me in a few minutes. Um, thank you so much for having us. We have been longstanding partners of the National Library of Medicine Disaster Information Resource Center, and we're very pleased to be here today. So thank you for the invitation. So the National Center for Disaster Medicine and Public Health, for folks on the phone who do not know, um, is a center of the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences uh, in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, the center was founded in 2008 under a Homeland Security Presidential Directive, which stated, among other things, that we were to be an academic center of excellence and would lead federal efforts to develop and propagate core curricula, training, and research. Uh, so the determination was made at that time when we were founded that the best way to achieve this was to house us at a university. So we're in this unique position of being a federal entity and an academic uh, center. So that gives us a great perspective over the field that's a little different than some other groups out there. Um, we are involved in a lot of different things in the field. Um, one highlight is that we're in the National Health Security Strategy, um, currently Strategic Objective 4, but as most of you know, um, there's a new Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, Dr. Bob Kadlik, um, on board, and so the National Strategy Security strategy um, is probably being looked at, and we will continue in that effort. So our mission is to improve our nation's disaster health readiness through education and science. And we work toward being the nation's academic center of excellence in both domestic and international disaster health. Um, throughout my presentation, I'll often talk about disaster health because um, Using all of the words in this uh, space is a mouthful, and um, I really think of it as disaster health because one of the roles that we play is bridging uh, medicine and public health. Um, so there's really the field, the aspects of the field that are focused on delivering medical care in disasters, and then the parts of the field that are looking at population health um, and the impacts on populations of disasters. And we really look at both sides of that. Uh, so, um, in October 2016, we got a new director, Dr. Thomas Kirsch, who came to us from Johns Hopkins University, and we're very pleased that he's here, and we kind of reframed our mission a little bit and looked at things through these lenses of um, readiness, education and training, research and scholarship, collaboration and leadership. So everything we do is um, framed within this space. And um, most of what we do overlaps each of these. Uh, and um, we really are at a strategic level looking at the landscape of disaster health, education, and science throughout the country and internationally. Um, so another part of our, um, when we were established, was that we're not only federal, but we're interagency. So our key um, interagency partners are the Department of Defense, the VA, HHS, um, both Assistant Secretary of Preparedness and Response and other um, partners within HHS, like CDC and NIH, um, Homeland Security, and Department of Transportation. So we really look to those key partners for guidance, um, product ideas, uh, you know, sort of to get a bit of a pulse on where the Fed um, writ large is on disaster health education and training and what their needs are. So, um, and we've kind of reorganized over the last year or so to have education and research as main lines of effort out of here. Um, but we continue to grow our staff and we um, now have a fellows program. Our first two fellows are actually sitting here in the room with us, so that's exciting. Uh, and we also um, are bringing in some visiting scholars over the next year to work with us. So these are exciting new developments. 
So as I said, we're academic and federal. We also work with academic partners and professional organizations, non-governmental organizations, subject matter experts in the field. Um, one of our key uh, components of our work, we really view ourselves as conveners and kind of um, neutral brokers that can bring people together to discuss the key issues in the field and lend uh, different perspectives and expertise because as we all know, it's a very diverse and broad field. Oh, here's our staff. Um, <laughs> And you know, this is always uh, growing as well, so probably more photos will be added in the near term. Um, and some recent specific accomplishments are, are um, we helped develop, along with our uh, Department of Transportation partners, the Model Uniform Core Criteria for Mass Casualty Triage. Um, instructional guidelines addendum. So that's a lot of words and really uh, it's an educational tool to help EMS providers throughout the country train their workforce around the 24 um, tenants of the model uniform core criteria. So triage is often discussed in the field um, and for a long time there was a lot of confusion and not a lot of evidence over which triage system was best. So um, Department of Transportation and EMS part leaders came together and did an evidence-based review and looked at um, what would be best and determined there was not one triage method that was best, but that there were these uh, core tenants that is, whatever method you use just has to meet those criteria. Um, so that was an exciting avenue for us and we're pleased that it's out in the world now. Um, I'm going to let, Victoria's going to focus on Stop the Bleed in a little bit so she can talk more about this, but um, as part of that effort we have a Stop the Bleed Education Consortium of very uh, high level experts in the field who are looking at the educational activities across the board because we're not the only ones in this space. Um, and again, trying to make high level recommendations about what should be included in Stop the Bleed Education. Um, this year we've really been focusing on sounding the alarm and we have this suite of projects that's um, focused on that. So looking at, you know, what's the current state in disaster um, health and particularly on research and education, kind of where are we as a field and where are the gaps and overlaps and um, trying, putting out some commentaries and papers on that issue. So, but I'm actually here to focus on our core curriculum, which uh, was just released in May and something we've been working on for a long time. So the core curriculum for disaster medicine and public health is based upon the core competencies. Um, and I have the citation at the bottom. Back in 2012, a large group of experts came together and looked at, you know, what are really the basics that disaster health professionals need to know. Um, one of the issues in our field is that we're so diverse. So if you look at the pyramid on the right there, there's all kinds of professions involved in disaster health, um, various specialties, various, um, you know, sort of first fields, so to speak. For a lot of people, disaster health is a second field or a second specialty. Um, so it can get overwhelming very quickly when you think about what everyone in this workforce needs to know. So the core competency effort was around at that bottom level, that core level, the to reach the broadest audience. What does everyone basics need to know before they're out in the field or before they're writing about these things, teaching about these issues in disaster health? So there's 11 core competencies. Um, the wording I have on the slide actually just boils them down because, again, each competency has lots of words and multiple sub-competencies. So um, if you're really into learning about all the competencies, I encourage you to pull that article and you can get really deep into it. Um, but for the purposes of today, I thought I'd just give you the overview. Um, and as you can see, it's really, um, it's sort of a, you know, disaster health 101. What do you need to know? Who who do you need to know on your team? Do you need to know your role? Um, you need to be safe and have situational awareness. You need to understand what people are talking about when they're talking about surge capacity and what some of the basics of clinical management are. Um, public health, ethics and legal, of course, is a complicated space, but again, it's um, sort of the 101 version of that. And then um, recovery considerations, which of course our understanding of recovery has come a long way in the past few years, but 
play on some of that research. Um, oh, it's a little hard to see, but this is a poster that um, Victoria uh, created and presented at the Preparedness Summit this past April. Um, and so again, to kind of show people that this is for everybody and it's not complicated or difficult, um, it's a modular, so on the right there, it kind of shows the screenshots for each module. So it's a modular curriculum. You don't have to take all 11 by any means. Uh, you can uh, pick and choose and take what is most relevant for you. Um, and I'm just going to play our little introductory video for you so you can get a taste of it. Imagine that a pandemic flu has struck the United States. Hospitals and public health clinics are being inundated with patients suffering from extreme respiratory distress, along with a steady stream of self-presenting individuals who are not yet ill, but who fear they may have been exposed to this contagion. While public health agencies and advocates have long encouraged people to develop personal and family preparedness plans, few did so, and confusion abounds. Roles and community response plans are not always clear, and health professionals are trying to help, but local agencies are overwhelmed. This story represents some of the challenges you may have experienced or heard about regarding disasters and public health emergencies. I'm here to talk to you about a curriculum we developed to help address those challenges in order to better prepare health professionals to support response and recovery efforts. First, let me introduce myself. I'm Kelly Gully, Senior Project Coordinator at the National Center for Disaster Medicine and Public Health at the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences. Back in 2012, a broad set of leaders in the field developed a core competency model that describes the core knowledge and skills that disaster medicine and public health professionals need to prepare for, respond to, and recover from disasters and public health emergencies. There are 11 core competencies in all, along with sub-competencies, and they're designed to help health professionals support situations like the one I described in the opening. In 2017, I worked with a team at the National Center to develop 11 online lessons focused on each of the 11 competencies to give health professionals like you the foundational knowledge you need. Each lesson was written by a leader in the field, including Dr. Matthew Winia, Dr. Dan Barnett, Dr. Edward Chu, and Dr. Lainey Rutkow. In addition, these leaders appear throughout the lessons on video to personally share their insights. You'll also hear from Dr. Thomas Kirsch and Condor Strauss-Riggs. The lessons range from 20 minutes to one hour in length, so you don't need to take all of them in one sitting. They each feature topics focused on each sub-competency sub-competency, as well as knowledge checks to help you test your knowledge, and then a capstone scenario where you put your knowledge into practice. Each lesson concludes with a reference list and additional resources to help you continue your learning journey. In addition, free continuing education credits will be offered for each lesson. We encourage you to take these lessons yourself, as well as encourage others to do so, or consider having your team complete the lessons and facilitate a live discussion about what you've learned. We want to hear your feedback on these lessons. After you complete each lesson, we have a small ask that you complete a brief five-minute survey about the lesson. We want to know what works and doesn't so that we can update the lessons over time to meet your needs and develop other products to serve you. And we encourage you to continue the conversation about what you've learned on the National Center social media and by reaching out directly to the National Center via our website. Follow the National Center on social media to keep up with ongoing developments and visit our website. And thank you for all you do to protect our nation's health from disasters. Imagine that a pandemic flu has struck the United States. Hospitals and public health clinics are being inundated with patients suffering from extreme respiratory distress, along with a steady stream of self-presenting individuals. Okay. 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 Thank you. Um, all right. And Thanks for coming. Just so you know, you stop sharing. You stop sharing your screen, so you might want to share your see screen our, again. Our, okay. Our blender. <laughs> we heard it. We couldn't see it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
So, sorry about that. Okay. Well, that's okay. I hope um, that you enjoyed our little intro video. It kind of gives you a flavor for what um, you're able to do in the curriculum, and then this is the direct web page um, that. Hopefully, uh, we designed to be as user-friendly as possible to be able to just um, click around easily and there's the core competency article is linked there um, and then each uh, module is here and it tells you how long it is, which competency it's meeting, um, and you can, like I said, uh, pick and choose to a certain degree. So um, we really hope that this is useful for you uh, in your setting or for um, stakeholders of your various groups and people in your community. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Victoria Klimzak, who is going to talk to you about an additional product of the center. Hopefully I won't wonder this. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Great. Okay. Hopefully everybody is seeing our screen still. Um, I'm Victoria Klimzak. Um, I'm project coordinator here at the center. I'd like to thank again uh, NLM staff for inviting us to do this. We really appreciate your help in getting our resources and tools out there. Um, well, so a little history about Stop the Bleed. Um, Stop the Bleed pretty much was derived from a, a civ mill concept. So meaning as the military, there was a, they saw a decrease in deaths um, since World War II to the recent times, and that was due to tourniquet application. Um, so they took that concept and they went ahead and they said, well, why don't we do something about this to see if we can improve the lay personnel. So they developed, as Condra said, that consortium and um, they had a bunch of meetings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm not going to go too much into that. Um, if you go to our website, you can actually see, it opens, maybe, maybe not. Chrome. Oh, that's right, Chrome. For some reason, Internet Explorer, they don't oh, like there. Yeah. There's a link, but also. Okay. Can you still see the screen? I hope you can. Um, research. Okay. For some reason, our thing doesn't support Internet Explorer very well. So a little history about Stop the Bleed is on this page on our website as well. It goes into more depth. As well, under the case education tab, um, if you scroll down and bring it to webinars, Dr. Goolsby actually conducted um, a webinar on the history of Stop the Bleed. So this is actually a really good webinar, um, not being, you know, biased or anything, but <laughs> um, I recommend that, you know, people watch that to get a better understanding of the whole Stop the Bleed White House initiative and how it came about. So with that said, National Center went ahead and conducted a research study. And in that research study, we've actually had uh, groups that were pre-exposed to a website and tool that we developed for teaching lay personnel how to apply pressure using a uh, tourniquet. And then a group that was not pre-exposed, all they received was a just-in-time training card, just had uh, instructional application. Um, as a result of that, we found that the pre-exposure group that applied the tourniquet 75% uh, successfully more, so um, compared as to 50% to the participants that just had the card alone. Um, so in that addition, the conclusion that we arrived is that it may help just as many as 75% of lay personnel properly apply a tourniquet. So some of the tools, sorry about this again, where does it look? Bear with me, I don't know if it will pull up properly, hopefully it will. Okay, so Stop the Bleed. This is our website that we created. You can actually access it through our site. Um, on the home page, there's a little frozen picture, I think of this. Click on that and it will take you straight to our Stop the Bleed website. Um, so pretty much there's, you know, yes or no, are you in emergency? We're going to head and go to no, we're not, <laughs> thank God. Um, they're pretty much similar, except the yes will take you straight to application of a tourniquet, 
whether you need to or not to determine, you know, if you need to. So for now, I'm going to show you a little teaser, and I'll show you our video we created. I swear, it does work. It's just <laughs> not lightning me today. Right, if you so want to try little. showing that, if you want to try showing that on um, Firefox, uh, I know uh, for me Firefox doesn't work well, but it might be better for you. Let me see. I was at the internet, so I'll try Chrome. Okay. Let's see. It's waiting for YouTube. I guess YouTube is having some issues. Okay, our computer is having lots of issues. Okay. Well, anyway, you'll have to check out the video, I guess, for yourself. And I do apologize for that. Um, it's a really good video. Again, not being biased. <laughs> um, so the video walked in me. Sorry about that. I do apologize. Um, so on the website, actually, you can go back to the website. I'll just show you other tools about the website. I never did say I was a technical expert, so I do apologize again for this. You know, don't worry about that. We all know what um, all right. what happens when we do these things. So carry on. Work. Oh, try one more time through Chrome. All right. Anyway, this starts playing great. So on our website, you'll see different things that goes into serious bleeding, not serious bleeding, um, and actually, oh, let's we'll see. If we can do this one. Yeah. So this is another thing that we created. Uh, it's like a quick kind of how to apply the tourniquet. Determine that you are safe where you are. Then tell someone to call 911. Okay. Place the tourniquet two to three inches above the wound, between the torso and the wound. Pull the free end of the Velcro strap and thread it through the buckle. Securely fasten it back onto itself. Next, twist the rod. Keep twisting until you know the bleeding stops. Dramatic. It is normal for this to cause some pain. Started. <laughs> Final the injuries are the leading cause of death for the small retro strap. And that some of these deaths. Right. Ah, uh, I think we're just going to. preventable? Go. Blood loss is playing. responsible for 35% of pre-hospital. Okay, we're just going to go back to what we're doing. That's just ridiculous. We've had, unfortunately, our internet connection here is not that great. So, so that it does not untwist. If bleeding hasn't stopped, apply a second tourniquet above the previous one. Closer Did you know that traumatic injuries are the leading cause of death for people under age 40? And that some of these deaths are preventable? Blood loss is responsible for 35% of pre-hospital deaths. And during mass casualty events, here. such as shootings, 80% of victims are Good delivered course. to hospitals okay. by someone other than a trained ambulance. Looks like it's working. Severe bleeding can lead to death in five minutes or less. Many people perish before an ambulance can arrive. But it doesn't have to be this way. It's time to stop the bleed. And you can be part of it. Stop the Bleed is a White House initiative that provides people like you with tools they need to take action against life-threatening wounds. In this brief video, we'll show you how to get involved. Everything was so normal. We were just going about our day, minding our business. But then there was this noise, like a loud pop. People were running and screaming, and then I saw people just lying on the ground, bleeding. What if this happened to you? Would you know what to do? Here are some initial pointers. Act quickly. 
What you do in the first few minutes is critical. Evaluate your safety. Is it safe for you to remain where you are? If not, evacuate the area. Tell someone to call 911. Apply pressure. Pressure is what stops bleeding. Let's explore the concept of pressure more. There are two basic kinds of pressure. Direct pressure and pressure applied via a tourniquet. There are two main ways to tell whether bleeding is serious enough to require a tourniquet. The volume of blood and the flow. Volume refers to the amount of blood present. Think about a soda can. Cut that amount in half. If that amount of blood is present, then it's serious life-threatening bleeding. Another warning sign is flow. If the blood is squirting, pooling on the surface, or if it's flowing continuously, then it's serious life-threatening bleeding. In a real-life scenario, you'd evaluate the volume and flow of blood to help you make decisions. This person's arm is injured, but it looks like neither the volume nor the flow of blood indicates we need a tourniquet. We need direct pressure instead. You, call 911. This person's injuries are more severe. There's more blood than half a soda can, and it's flowing really fast. That means I need to use a tourniquet to apply pressure. So you've decided you need a tourniquet. What next? You need to find or make one. Two basic types of tourniquets are out there. Commercial and makeshift. Commercial tourniquets are the most effective. If you're in a public facility, you may be able to find one in a bleeding control kit, often found near an AED display. If that's not an option, apply strong pressure with your hands, or use available materials like a t-shirt or towel. Tourniquets are used for severe bleeding on arms and legs not other parts of the body. The key idea is only the limbs. Apply direct pressure to stop bleeding on other parts of the body. In this video, we'll focus on pressure applied via a commercial tourniquet. Place the tourniquet two to three inches above the wound. Be careful to place it above the injury, not directly on top of it. Then, simply pull, twist, and clip. Pull the free end of the Velcro strap thread it through the buckle, and securely fasten it back onto itself. Twist the rod until the bleeding stops, or until you can't twist anymore. Note that this step will be painful for the injured person. Be persistent. Be sure that the bleeding stops. Clip the rod with the small Velcro strap, securing it so that it doesn't untwist. If bleeding continues and you've tightened the tourniquet as much as you can, you can apply a second tourniquet above the first, closer to the torso. Although applying the tourniquet is simple, watch out for these common mistakes. Mistake number one, not knowing when to apply a tourniquet. Tourniquets aren't appropriate for all injuries. Don't use it for a minor injury or on the trunk of the body. But for life-threatening bleeding on the arms and legs, don't be afraid to use a tourniquet. Mistake number two, not tightening the tourniquet enough to stop bleeding. Also, remember to keep twisting until bleeding stops. If it doesn't stop, add a second tourniquet closer to the torso, above the first tourniquet. Mistake number three, placing the tourniquet directly on top of the wound. The tourniquet should go just above the wound, on the side closest to the torso. Mistake number four, loosening the tourniquet. Leave the tourniquet on until medical professionals arrive. Even if the victim complains of pain, the victim could bleed to death quickly if the tourniquet is removed. Hopefully you'll never have to apply a tourniquet, but knowing how can save a life. Thanks for helping stop the bleed. This message was brought to you by the National Center for Disaster Medicine and Public Health at the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences. Okay. That was the video that we created and used in our study. Um, there's also a lot of facts and resources on here. There's a little quiz that you can do, um, and it gives you the answers if you get them right and wrong. Um, glossary definitions, as well as some really good resources that was used um, to help us create the content in our educational tools um, and their links. And another thing, real quick, another tool that we used in our study, let me get to it, 
was a PDF, so we have it in PDF version here. We had a just-in-time training card, and it was this card exactly that we gave the um, participants. So feel free um, to hang this up, share it, pass it along. Um, Okay, as well as just the audio instructions. Um, that's another tool that we've created. Because as we know, everybody doesn't learn the same. Some are visual, some are audio, some are hands-on. So we tried to cover all the areas. Um, all right. And then lastly, in addition, we created an app. Um, Here's a little teaser of the app. Goes into pretty much the same stuff that the, the website does, but just in a different functionality. Um, same content, same tools. A uh, little different, you can share stuff on Facebook, etc. It's available both on, yes, Google Play and Android. Um, and here's the link that they're at. Um, it's free, mind you. and then, um, it's just a really good tool to have in your pocket, amongst many other tools that are out there. All right, and that's it for me. Those are the educational tools that we developed for Stop the Bleed. Um, thank you again so much for allowing us to do this, and we hope that these resources and tools will help many. So we're happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. I know that in the chat box there is a question that says, okay. um, oh, are you there, Stacy? Okay, go ahead. I think I am here now. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, Siobhan was about to say, for so long we were told not to apply a tourniquet. It seems like in the past year there's been a sudden change to encourage doing it. Did something really change? Um, so pretty much it was just a lack of knowledge. Um, no one really knew. It was just a lot of myths. No one really knew if, you know, anybody could just apply a tourniquet. Um, they used to think, you know, the old rule of your leg will fall off concept. Um, and obviously, as technology and education has gone, increased and grown over the years, um, so has the research, et cetera. Um, there's actually a lot of white paper and publications on our website. If you go to um, publications and then they have, are you still seeing my screen? I don't think so. I don't think so. Did I say stop sharing? Um, well, under our website, we have the publications. Um, there's a handful of them that Dr. Goolsby and others uh, contributed to, all the way back from explaining the whole concept of battlefield to bedside, and, and then the addition of our studies included in there, as well as future studies hopefully will be in there as well um, for different types of bleeding control tools. Um, but yeah, it's yeah. Just, education has changed. So I think, yeah, as Victoria said, it's really the research um, to back up the use of tourniquets um, which the research is primarily coming out of uh, battlefield medicine, military medicine. Um, I think additionally, our uh, time to transport uh, emergency patients is, in most parts of the country, um, much lower than it used to be. So that's a lot of it, too. Tourniquets are um, typically not uh, on for nearly as long as they used to be. Yeah, I believe like they were, I saw that like 80% of the people that go to a hospital due to like a blood related loss re injury um, are not taken by EMS. They're actually taken by someone they know or loved or a stranger. So in that regard, that's another good tool is that if these people have that tool under their belt, hopefully there'll be more survival than less death. I hope that well, answers your question. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't see other questions, so so I guess maybe I'll ask a question then. But we're again welcome to um, send send things in via via chat. Um, when people take training, um, do you get a tourniquet when you take training, or do you recommend what type of tourniquet to buy and where? So actually, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, we right now don't have any recommendations for say on our website. Um, the one that we used in our training was the CAT tourniquet, which is the one that the military uses. You can actually purchase that on Amazon. Um, I think I've seen some on eBay. Um, I've seen them all over, all over the place. Um, even like hunting stores, like I think Dick's Sporting Goods, stuff like that. They, they sell them, as well as there's companies out there. Now, before warned, there's companies that are making Stop the Bleed kits, and 
in, their prices, in my opinion, are really high, um, whereas you can save money and make your own kit. So actually, I'm working on putting on our page that I showed you that had the research page, um, how to make your own kit. I'm going to create like a one-pager and, you know, just recommendations of what to put in it. Okay. Um, but, um, so is this training going to be like incorporated? I was just thinking like with CPR training or something, can you like do it all in one fell swoop to get more people exposed to it? Yeah, so funny you ask that. We're yeah. actually working with the Red Cross right now. Um, they're developing a curriculum in regards to uh, stop the bleed, hemorrhage control, and we're helping them determine by conducting another research project on which they should add to the curriculum other than a tourniquet, because there are many tools out there to stop the bleed. So yes, um, actually the Red Cross will be offering that soon. Mm -hmm. Um, as well as, using. I don't know if they're going to supply the people that attend with the tourniquet to take home. That I don't know yet, but I can actually bring that up yeah. um, when we meet with them. And, um, but yeah, as of now right now, not many trainings give a tourniquet um, as part of the training. Um, but yeah, it's a great question because um, Red Cross as a partner is really key for dissemination, obviously, of this uh, information. I mean, um, you know, we have great uh, partners and friends of the National Center, but the Red Cross trainings reach, you know, millions of people. So we're very excited that they're going to be using these materials um, in their trainings. Um, I'm not exactly sure what timeline that's on, maybe in a year or so. I think they're starting to incorporate it in. Well, that's great. Well, um, uh, appreciate that. And it's, you know, it's, it's always if you have a captive audience, you know, can you can you keep them for just a little longer and teach them uh, something else is, right. is always kind of uh, kind of nice, um, and, you know, and add that add that little piece in. Um, and um, I just want to see if there's other questions that people. Okay, let's. Um, so somebody wrote in that they would attend a Stop the Bleed session and attended it, and it was uh, easy and very informative. And thank said thank you. So that's always good to know. Um, right. And let's see, I, I had a silly question, if that's, if that's permitted. No so she was question. Brought up, Go ahead. brought up by my colleague when you were talking about half a can of soda in there, and we said, oh, but half the country says the word pop, not soda. Pop. I wonder uh, if that came up in your, in, your, uh, in your study at all, or if you were a mostly East Coast study participant. <laughs> that's funny, because... Um, this is Condra, as someone who grew up in the Midwest and always said pop, I did bring that up when we were developing this. Uh, and I think, you know, it sort of was, we kind of had to make a decision, I guess, and ended up going that way. <laughs> Being from, I'm new, from New York, um, I didn't know what the word pop meant when they were saying that until someone explained to me. Soda. So, but whereas Westerners understand that pop is soda, so I think that's why we came to the conclusion that soda is the more general term <laughs> to use. Good point, though. Yes, yeah, there's uh, mul multiple terms for the same word. You know, here at the, here at, at a library, we, we focus on uh, uh, oh, you know, thesaurus and, and synonyms and things like that. So that's why I had to had to bring that up. Keep growing. <laughs> All right, so now I have another question, which I'm reading it here, might be actually more for us, Siobhan. Okay. Um, who, is, uh, who all is typically performing searches on disaster literature? Maybe a better way to ask is who all should um, I, as a disaster information specialist and medical librarian, be trying to make aware of the disaster literature resources? So Siobhan, would you like to answer that? Yeah, I will. Um, so Robin, Taylor, and I do um, the majority of the searches on disaster lit and we for disaster lit and we have a methodology to our madness so it's not just some random selection of materials um, one of the things that I would recommend you do if you're interested in um, seeing what has been added to disaster lit we have um, on that gov delivery uh, I'm on the um, let me see, I'm going to have to go to it on my page. So I'm going to, I'm going to request that you send the, um, give me the ability to share my screen, and I can do this pretty quickly. Um, on, our, on our page, we have, okay, I'm going to share my screen. So I'm on the home page, and at the bottom, uh, we, I talked about, um, oh, where did it go? I talked about the ability to join the email updates, and so um, 
Uh, it, I'm going to just pop in here and I'll show you. Okay, I consent to my privacy policy, even though you've all just seen. I don't know why it's doing that. Okay, <laughs> here we go. So we have actually, if you go to that page and you subscribe, you can see we send out emails daily and weekly um, on what we've added to the disaster lit database. And um, we also tweet about it um, every day on, um, on our Twitter account. Every day has at the end of the day what the, um, what the latest, I want to, because I want to show you what it looks like. So here we go. And if there's any other questions while I'm finding this, you can sure go ahead and ask them. But um, you can see every day we have review the latest items added to Disasterlet. And so this is what the email will look like. So yesterday there was just one thing added. Um, it will take you right to Disasterlet. So you'll get an email that shows you this. Um, a lot of times we have, have to five to ten point. items added. So I'm sorry. Um, I hope that that answers your question. Um, I, I think, Siobhan, also the question was looking at who are the people that would be um, uh, using this, and if you have your disaster information specialist, who should you be marketing uh, your skills to to make sure they, they know about it? Um, oh, that's a oh, great question. Yes, so, so what I tell people is to first look within their organization. Um, so if you're a public library, what's, what does your town have for um, emergency operations center? Um, there's probably somebody in your library that goes to the monthly meetings already. If you're in a hospital, your hospital must have emergency operations planners within the hospital. So you look to your organization and find out um, who runs the Emergency Operations Center. And then um, you can start to work with those people to say, uh, I can, you know, what kinds of information do you want? Do you want me to send you a daily update? I, I do know a lot of people who, who go to get this email and they'll go through it and they, they have made connections with people in their organization and they'll send them um, specific information that they see that's been added to Disaster Lit. I think it's um, it's something that we try to say here at Timrick that we are that's our job is to find the latest information for you, and then you're the local person who knows what your community needs. So take the resources and share them, and um, it's a, it's very much a value that you are adding to your organization when you can do things like that. You. People are um, always in the in the emergency operations centers, the public health departments. They're always very thankful to get this kind of information sent to them by someone who knows what they need. Right, I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, thanks, Siobhan. Um, are there other questions? I don't see any right now, except for now we're up to four synonyms. We have soda, pop, soft drinks, and fizzy drinks from England. Um, are there other questions that might be coming in? I'm, I'm typing in my um, email address into the chat box. Um, we've changed the way that we give out CE, or that MLA has changed the way that they distribute CEs. So if you want a CE for this, you can earn one hour CE. Just email me and I will tell you how to do it. Right now you have to log into the MLA learning management system and we'll give you a code. Um, that lets you um, uh, get your MLACE certificate for attending this class. We're going to be updating our website with this information, but right now it's not up there. All right, so, are there um, any? Oh. Yeah, I, I think there's not, Stacey. I think uh, we can probably okay. um, say thank you so much to our presenters, Victoria and Condra, and to the National Center for Disaster Medicine and Public Health for being on our call and sharing these really amazing resources with us. And um, we'll and we uh, need, keep you and up to date. we need to sign up for a Stop the Bleed for, um, for our staff here, right, Siobhan? Oh, sure. That's right. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be more than happy to come there and do it. Yeah. That, that would be, that'd be terrific. Great. Well, we right. really appreciate you having us. Thank you so much. All right. Thank great. you. Ha have a good hey, day. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.